this art world is an art world that moves at hyperspeed these days. We all are used to swiping screens from one to the next and giving them a few seconds to a minute at most of attention. Find your moments to slow down and figure out where you can go deeply with art as opposed to trying to be everywhere at all times and know everything at all times. Welcome to Collect Wisely, an ongoing series of podcasts in which we sit down with people who care deeply about art to discuss their passion for collecting. Before we begin our interview, I'd like to share our vision for Collect Wisely. This is an initiative we've wanted to do for quite some time, in which we question the nature of collecting and connoisseurship in the 21st century, and through doing so, hope to inspire a new generation of collectors and individuals committed to making a vital and meaningful investment in our common cultural future. My name is Sean Kelly, and I have had a gallery in New York since 1991. Each Collect Wisely episode will bring you personal stories from the perspective of an individual collector, where we delve into their passion for collecting, what drives them and what inspires them. We are sitting in freeze at the art fair having this conversation on a particularly warm, noisy day in an art fair. In this episode, we're speaking with Greg Miller. Greg currently serves as president of the board of directors of White Columns, New York's oldest non-profit alternative space. He's a member of the painting and sculpture committee of the Whitney Museum and founded an eponymous art book publishing company in 2004. Greg and his husband, Michael Werner, have an extensive collection of contemporary art featuring work by Garda Romare, Carol Dunham, Wade Guyton, Glenn Ligon, Kathy Opie, and Adrian Piper, amongst others. They've been participants in the Armory Show's Collectors Program since its inception, opening their home to share their collection of contemporary art. Welcome, Greg, and thank you for joining us today at Freeze to do this podcast live. Very glad to be here. Starting right at the beginning, I'm going to throw you an easy question, and at the end, <laughs> I'll give you the difficult ones. What was the first artwork you bought, and, and do you still own it? The first artwork I bought was a photograph by Lyle Ashton Harris, and it was in Lyle's first show at Jack Tilton's Gallery in Soho, and I believe that show was in 1994. And I do still own the work. It's a work called Exfoliation. And uh, in fact, here at Freeze, it's uh, a pleasure to see a very early work of Lyle in one of the booths here from the time that that show huh. had just come out. So providing some historical context. Yeah, indeed. And, and he's an artist whose work we've collected over time. There you know, are a number of artists whose works we've collected in depth. And you know, at this point, we probably have about 20 works by Lyle covering wow. you know, all periods of his practice since uh, those early days in, in the 90s. Do you know how many works you have in the collection altogether? We have approximately 500 works in the collection at this point. And how many artists would you collect in, in the kind of depth that you're collecting Lyle? Oh, I would say artists whose works we collect in depth, um, you know, and sometimes that's represented by number of pieces and sometimes that's represented by you know, a commitment to a few major works if they're the sort of artists whose works we're not really in a position to collect in depth either because we come too late or their careers have taken off uh, to a point where uh, the cost of collecting them in depth is, is a bit out of range. But I would say that's about you know, a dozen to 15 artists whose works for us really have been central to the collection and our own relationship, sometimes with the artist, but you know, most importantly with the work itself. Is that a very deliberative intention of the collection to have certain artists who may anchor ideas within the collection that you follow over the arc of their careers? I wouldn't always say that it's deliberative at the beginning or a planned collecting strategy, but you know, in the case of these artists, you've named a few of them, you know, beginning to collect their works early on, you know, certainly going back to the mid nineties, you know, at a time when you could really follow an, an artist from show to show and make sometimes more than one acquisition of works from the shows. Ended up becoming deliberative in, you know, in some instances, and 
you know, certain artists whose works have, I guess you could say, spoken, you know, to us, whether it's the conceptual thrust of their work or how those artists are situated relative to other artists who are of interest, whether they're in the collection or not. That's often what makes the collecting of their work a bit more of a focused strategy when we can continue to collect those artists. Is Michael equally involved in the collection? He is, and we uh, look at nearly you know, every work uh, together. You know, there are certainly times when I have made an independent decision on my own and informed him after the fact that How did we that were adding down? the work. Usually it goes down very well. He, uh, he and I uh, tend to have uh, consistent thoughts about works that might be the sort of works that resonate in the collection and that doesn't always mean that we would have chosen the exact same work by that particular artist but I think we often agree that a work makes sense for us. Um, do either of you come from collecting households? Were your parents collectors? Or? Neither of us neither of us were. You know, my family, you know, has always, you know, been you know, interested in the arts very broadly defined, but we didn't grow up, you know, in a major city. I grew up in a town in Pennsylvania about three hours from New York, but going to New York at least once a year was something that we did and going to the museums was something that we did. But collecting for me really came about uh, not because of a decision to become a collector, and I think that's the case, at least for many collectors I know. You don't necessarily set out you know, to become a collector, even when you buy your first work. You don't know what path that will put you on. But for me, it really came about when I moved to New York in 1993. I had lived in New York after university from 87 to 89, and then in London for a year would go to museums but really wasn't aware of the gallery scene and worked in a job in finance that gave me very little time even on the weekends to to do too much but when I moved back in 93 I was really interested actually in starting to look at work that was being made by artists who were my peers or the artists you know who were living and making you know work in that moment and as you know the museums didn't have as many opportunities for contemporary art to be shown. The gallery world was not as immense as it was. And I started to um, spend Saturday mornings in Soho going to galleries, including your gallery, really as a way to just see the art that was there. And it was after a year or so of doing that, meeting some people, talking to folks like you who were open to a conversation with an interested person, that I overcame the intimidation factor and asked about the cost of a work. There wasn't a gene, there wasn't a family gene of collecting. So you're the first, let's say you're the first in your family that's that's engaged sure. in this very passionate pursuit. Mm -hmm. I mean, to own 500 works is significant mm -hmm. and to be owning so many in, so, in, in such depth is, is significant. So I'm, I'm very interested in, can you attribute that impetus to something specific? Yeah, well, Where did it come from? Yeah, I, I've thought about that a lot and I actually think that it came from a long-standing love of contemporary fiction. Books have always been important to me, and from high school and through college, and still always have a work of contemporary fiction in hand. And unlike, as I was saying, the works by the writers who are writing today are readily available. And I think I was really looking for the equivalent in contemporary art to what I was finding in contemporary fiction, which was, you know, an art experience that tells you something about yourself, tells you something about the world. And going to museums, you couldn't see too much art that was made, not only by my peers, but made, you know, in that moment. You know, I remember going to a MoMA projects room show and shows and realizing, oh, these are artists you know, who just made these, these works. As I started going around to galleries, I discovered white columns and had some dialogue there. That became the impetus, really, to think about what it would mean to first be a part of the contemporary art world in some way. And for me, as a person in my late 20s, that way to participate initially was to first look at the art, and then ultimately when I saw that for $1,500 or a couple thousand dollars, I could actually own a piece of art, I did. 
because it spoke to me. And, and at that time, I mean, you're a fairly young collector, recently moved to New York, relatively recently out of college. I mean, that's a lot of money to go and spend on an artwork. I mean... It was indeed. <clears throat> and, I... <laughs> and, you know, was that a huge moment for you to spend that kind of money on, on an artwork and to think... You know about all the implications of what that artwork would mean over a longer period of time. It definitely was. After collecting more than a few works and realizing that I was using up, you know, all of my bonuses from my financial world job for art, as opposed to you know saving it for a potential down payment on an apartment. And we're not talking big dollars here, but they were you know big on a relative basis for me. It became a choice, and I think for me. And this is still the case when we make an acquisition of a work of art. It's a choice. You know, there are far, far more works that we would love to own than we are able to own. And I think that choice, you know, is something that has made the collecting even more meaningful. Have and you sold anything that you've collected? So over the years, we have only sold three things. These were three quite minor works were by artists who's careers had taken off or certainly had taken off at the time that we sold the works and we're not talking large sales here but it was an opportunity when we had committed to an apartment to <laughs> advance a renovation process along to turn works that were not quite as central and meaningful to us that had cost so you a would. small amount of money and could be at that time exchanged right. for but in money. interesting that you weren't selling. So these are presumably artists where you you were not collecting in depth necessarily. It, it, not, so you a, weren't not at all. Breaking up, you know, a sort no. of arc of a collecting a very passionate collection. But at the same time, interesting that you weren't selling things that you were disaffected by or felt had failed in some way. You were you were selling things that were successful, uh, and yes. and it was about moving a program forward. Mm. But you know, you weren't judgmentally deciding that there was something in the collection that you didn't like or weren't committed to or wasn't wasn't progressing in some way. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair characterization. They're, they were good works, but not works that we felt passionately enough about right. to keep. No, I mean, it's a sort of natural process. It's a sort right. of, uh, mm. I always likened this more to the process of being an editor. It, yes. I mean, one of the things, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you, and we'll come on to this a little bit more, particularly is we both share a very particular passion for, for writing, for writers, for, for fiction. We both read a lot. And you've taken that a step further because you've actually opened a company, Gregory R. Miller & Company, that publishes art books. And in addition to your day job, if that wasn't enough, and you've, you know, you're extensive, you, know, you have a family, you have children, you have dogs, you know, have all those things that we all uh, uh, enjoy. But you're also a publisher and you're very committed to publishing books um, very specialized books in the art world. Are they always books on artists that are in the collection, or how do you make those choices? No, there are certainly some books that we've done by artists and focused on artists whose works are in the collection, but that is not the driving um, decision behind our publishing program. Those books, which were the earlier books, came out of, to some degree, relationships with artists where I could approach them as a brand new publisher and say you haven't you know had a book we would love to do you know a book that gives you the treatment that a significant museum with more importantly you know a dedicated publishing department is able to give you and the reason I started this company was to fill that gap and primarily to do monographs on on artists whose careers merited a book but those artists hadn't yet had either the retrospectives or the exhibitions that would come along with a serious catalog that covered a career in a comprehensive way and had writing in it by scholars, art historians, and curators. So that was really the motivation. But you're collaborating with the artists in a very particular way, and it's a very... For them, I think it's a, a fabulous opportunity because the initiative for that book is not linked to a specific project. So it can be a very independently minded publication. That's exactly right. You know, as someone who not only loves books, but loves the, the process of making a book. And often having the finished book in hand 
is most exciting is an emblem of all that you did to get there. It's really the collaboration that is the most, most meaningful part of, of publishing and the direct dialogue with an artist about the book that makes the most sense for him or for her has been a catalyst for a lot of our publishing. Do you think do of book. yourself as also as a book collector? We have a very extensive library, but I'm not a book collector in the way that I'm an art collector. But I you do are... like to have the first editions of the books that we have in the sure. library, but I don't collect historically. So you are a, so there is a distinction here where you are you would define yourself as a very passionate art collector. Uh, not necessarily as a book collector. And that's very interesting to me that you've elected to identify that distinction. So what is it, just to drill down on this a little more, what is it about living artists? Because you're primarily collecting living artists, if not exclusively. What is it about collecting living artists, the art of your time, which you've done? And you've collected a lot of work which had um, a political orientation yes. with a small p. What is it about that work that really is, you know, is the most exciting to you? Yeah, I think the ability to have a work of art in your life, and that is not just when it's on a wall or in a space that you inhabit every day when the work's in your home, but also knowing that it's in the collection. Partly you're a steward of that work, and that, you know, is a very, for me, important and vitalizing relationship but you also have a relationship to the work that is very tangible and very visceral alongside the you know intellectual or emotional relationship and the ownership of the piece if you're a collector at least a collector like me is something that intensifies that relationship you know i can have a great relationship with the work of art in a museum and it's fantastic that works are museums and that's where they should be you own over 500 artworks that you've amassed over the last 20 plus years. I've been in your home. You clearly do not hang 500 <laughs> no, artworks. No, So many of the artworks are elsewhere. So they're in storage somewhere, are being looked after. How often do you rehang the collection? And are you constantly looking for connections within the collection that you want to uh, sort of uh, illustrate or, or a dynamic? in the collection that you want to pull back out mm -hmm. and indeed are there things in the collection that have lain dormant for a long time and you think oh my gosh I've got to get that out of storage and I want to see it in relationship to X it, yes so we don't do wholesale rehangs of the collection on a regular basis but at least once a year we are making enough changes to the hanging or to the installation of works uh, in uh in our home that, as we often experience, leads to the domino effect of many more changes than you anticipated. And when we do a rehang uh, or bring new work in, it, it is often with the intention of you know, pairing works or looking at works that we haven't seen for some time together. And you know, I'll give you an example recently, um, and this is a work when I knew that I was definitely you know a collector and hooked we bought a nine foot by 12 foot painting by the artist Gada Amer from a major show that she had here in New York in 2000 or 2001 no ability even if we wanted to install it to install it in the apartment that we were renting at the time but I just knew we had to have that work thankfully I think that's the definition of a collector thankfully that work for about 18 months traveled around so we didn't have to worry about storing it we have had that work up once. It's a work that needs to be taken off the stretcher and unrolled and then put back on in the apartment to hang. And we decided to bring that out just recently and thought about what types of works would, would go well with it. And interestingly, we paired a couple Carol Dunham pieces, you know, including one that's rather aggressive. And that led to us bringing out a very early Sue Williams work that is also a quite aggressive piece when the P for political was, you know, perhaps capitalized and not just a lowercase p. And that interaction, which we partly had planned and partly unfolded, ended up being a very meaningful part of what was a broader rehang and actually did bring out some earlier political works 
from the collection, including an early series of works by Lorna Simpson and a relatively early work from Glenn Ligon. When we installed this work by Gadamer, which is you know, a large piece that we hadn't uh, installed for some time, we thought about what other works to pair with it. And we decided to install a couple works by Carol Dunham, you know, including one early piece and, and one piece that's you know, rather aggressive in its imagery. And that led to us bringing out a work that we hadn't installed for a very long time, which is one of Sue Williams' early works from the early 90s, which is a very tough image, tough writing in the, uh, you know, on the canvas. And these works started interacting in a way that did lead us to have perhaps a more political hanging than we otherwise would have had because we made a decision then to bring out some early works by both Lyle Ashton Harris and Lorna Simpson, also from the 90s. And so we keep the work in dialogue, but sometimes that dialogue gets ahead of our planning and we follow it. And a lot of that work was bought, in a way, in a previous existence for you before you had a family. It was and, indeed. And, and some of that work, as you've described, is quite tough. I, I can remember when my kids were growing up and we had a very intense series of works by Marina Abramovich up in our loft that uh, the kids' friends would come over for play dates and the mothers would come to pick them up and they'd say, oh my gosh, what is this? <laughs> and the kids would just say, oh, that's Auntie Marina. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and that kind of work never phased the, our children or our dogs, and you also have a number of dogs. Do you think about those concerns now that you have a young family? Yeah, well, our, our son is 18 months at this, uh, at this stage, so he's as you're indicating, you know, a little less aware of what he's looking at than the nanny and the, the parents and nannies of, right. of his friends. We, we host a good number of play dates, so we're used to watching over little kids in, <laughs> in a space that has not get, just art on the walls, but also you, a number of sculptural pieces that are very tempting. Do you get any pushback tempting. from other parents? Or? We have not. I think that they see the installation of the work as, as serious. You know, our hangings tend not to be salon style and aiming to fill as much space with art as you possibly can fill. While it's certainly not curated in a way that a true curator would, would think about it because it's so personal and we're not curators, it's a deliberate choice that looks serious, even if the art is not always super serious itself. So I think people respect that and they can sense that. Mm -hmm. And the imagery doesn't seem to phase them, at least not after the first shot. You used a word a few minutes ago that I want to return to. You talked about being a steward and stewardship of the collection. You're a little young for me to ask this question of. Have you started to think about what the collection means in the context of the future? Are you thinking about, you know, a lot of collectors these days are opening private institutions, mm -hmm. what they, they, you know, their own foundations, their own museums. Are you thinking about institutions? Are you thinking about the collection remaining together as a whole? What is your idea about the stewardship of the collection moving forward? We have no plans, no commitments. I wouldn't anticipate trying to keep the whole collection together because I do believe that you know the range of work can resonate and perhaps be more fruitful in a range of contexts. And when I say context, I really do think you know about institutions in the future. In addition to the Whitney, I'm the co-chair of Tate's North American Acquisition Committee. Over the last several years, I have seen how Tate's curators have brought work into that collection and not just displayed it, but shown how artwork can inform and activate a collection in so many different contexts. Just yesterday, I was at a painting and sculpture committee meeting at the Whitney and we were considering you know a quite significant more historical work that was quite expensive and it was the number of different ways that that work could be displayed as part of the collection that led the committee to make the decision that that was a good way to use a meaningful portion of our funds and my sense of stewardship is to for that work that will be meaningful to the public or potentially meaningful to the public to get it into the places where it can do what it has done for us which is teach us make us a bit more aware of 
ourselves and you know give us a way of looking and thinking that's a bit deeper as a result of having had that work in our hands. So Greg, if you had a Dorian Gray moment, the better aspects of the Dorian Gray moment, not the worst aspects of the Dorian Gray moment, I hasten to add, and you bumped into your younger self as a collector at a party or a cocktail event, and you were asking advice of yourself, what advice would you give to your younger self about setting out on on the journey of collecting? Um, Well, I would probably give the advice then that you know, in my head I tried to follow, but you didn't really always know the importance of following that advice. And that is to, one, never stop looking and never stop trying to think a bit about what you're looking at. And there are lots of ways to be informed as a collector. And I think that the combination of dialogue, with artists when you have that opportunity, dialogue with curators when you have that opportunity, but alongside you know, a dialogue with yourself about what does it mean to you to be doing this will make the passionate collector more of an informed collector. And you can get a great deal of information about what you're collecting and about the market context for your collecting, and that is vital. But I think you naturally absorb that if you are... collecting in a fully engaged way. And the piece of advice that I would give myself now, and I have to continue to give myself this advice, this art world is an art world that moves at hyperspeed these days. We all are used to swiping screens from one to the next and giving them a few seconds to a minute at most of attention. Find your moments to slow down and figure out where you can go deeply with art as opposed to trying to be everywhere at all times and know everything at all times. It is impossible. It's impossible. The depth is what makes the breadth better. And that's that's great advice. And it actually leads me to my perfect segue, thank you, into my next question, which is I'd really love if you could give us a, a fairly sort of condensed definition of what connoisseurship means to you. I think, for me, connoisseurship is less about becoming a true expert, at least as it relates to art, because art is not my full-time job. It is a passion, and it's something that I'm highly engaged about. But connoisseurship in an art context, for me, means you know having a true dialogue with the art, thinking about what art means and this is for me, in both a historical context and in the context in which, if we're talking about contemporary art, it's being made. And a couple weekends ago, I went to the Zerberon show at the Frick and the Jan Vo show at the Guggenheim. And I think connoisseurship is being in a position to have both of those experiences involving artists nearly 500 years apart from each other in a way that means something. And I think very little art that stands the test of time is made without some awareness of history. And that can be more recent history or it could be history that goes back many, many years or centuries. And I think connoisseurship has to have a bit of that awareness as well. Of, it's of not historical continuity. Of historical continuity. And it's not just about knowing every name on a label at an art fair. Okay. Well, you're the perfect interviewee because you've just given me another perfect segue into my final question for you today. And that is to ask you, if you could choose, if you were in a, a white room and, and you knew that you were going to spend eternity in there or perpetuity in there, and you could pick one single artwork to live with. It doesn't have to be something you own. It doesn't have to be something that uh, is contemporary. It can be a historical work from anywhere in the world to sustain you visually. What would that single artwork be? There are so many choices one can make in response to that question. Having been in Madrid for work and having a few hours of time to make my way to the Prado and the Prado is filled with things 
that you can look at. And I found myself spending a good 30 minutes in front of Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights. Sure. That was a work that, for that 30 minutes, held me truly in front of it, trying to figure out just what was going on in there, because the more you looked at it, the more you understood that it wasn't just about what he was representing. Right. And many artworks could probably achieve that for me, but that's the one that comes first to mind a, in response to your question. A fabulous choice, and the first choices, as we know, are often the very best. So I would really like to thank you so much for sitting down with us today. I know you very busy here uh, at the fair and uh, have a lot to do. I really want to thank you so much for sitting down with us here to share your thoughts on what collecting wisely and connoisseurship and what your collection has meant for you as a journey. It's been an incredible pleasure and thank you so much. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Collect Wisely can be found on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Overcast, and Google Play. You can also find our episodes on our YouTube page. Just search Sean Kelly Gallery. Please be sure to subscribe to get the freshest episodes when they release. And if you really like the show, please give us a review or drop a comment. Or you can email us at info at sky.com. You can also follow the Sean Kelly Gallery at Sean Kelly NY on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Cheers. Thank you.